Welcome to HBTV. I'm Harry Binswanger, the HB in HBTV. And with me today is Jean Maroney Binswanger, who by coincidence has the same last name. Oh no, you're my wife. Right. Not such a coincidence. <laughs> Not such a coincidence. And this, um, well, uh, th to give her credentials, uh, she has a, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science from MIT in Electrical Engineering. And she has a Master's in Psychology from Carnegie Mellon. She worked in between those last two degrees for about six years, wasn't it, for uh, Advanced Optical? Adaptive that, Optics Associates. Uh, Adaptive Optics Associates on some really exciting um, light-based uh, ranging of, uh, for, of stars to get the twinkle out of the stars for the telescopes. That's a story she may want to go into. But uh, for the last, uh, what's well, 90, 30 years, yeah. you've been in the field really of psychoepistemology which is uh, Ayn Rand's term for the your own personal psychological epistemology, how you process information, how your conscious mind interacts with the stored data in your subconscious. So uh, she is going to take up this uh, question about central purpose because it's right in her wheelhouse. So Jean, what is the central purpose, first of all? Well, fortunately, this is an easy question. It's a softball question because Leonard Peikoff defined central purpose in objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand. And when Leonard Peikoff defines a term, you know you've got it nailed. He says a central purpose is the long range goal that constitutes the primary claimant on a man's time, energy, and resources. So let's just highlight a couple of the really important things there. First that of all, word was changes that word was claimant, C L A I M A N T, the correct. thing that claims. Yeah, correct. And so, in in its simplest form, a central purpose is just a long range goal. There's nothing magical about it. I think sometimes people say, "Oh, I need a central purpose." Oh no, how am I going to do that? It's it's a long range goal. It does not have to be a calling. Some people have uh, what's called a calling is they feel like they have a lifelong passion to do something and they devote their entire life to it. And I have, I have a calling because basically the reason I left engineering and went into psychology is I, I realized that I didn't think as well in the humanities as I could think in the engineering. And I wanted to fix that problem, figure out how to fix it and teach other people to fix it. And that has sustained me for 30 years and it's gonna sustain me for the rest of my life. So I have a calling. That made my central purpose really easy, but you don't have to have a calling. For the purposes of a central purpose, you just need a long range goal. I'd say at least three years. Most central purposes are more like 10 years, but it's not that complicated. It's, but it is a particular kind of goal. It's that primary claimant. It's the goal you put first and that in effect organizes your life. You organize your life around achieving this long range goal. And that's inherent in, in a long range goal, a three to 10 year goal. If you do not organize your life around it, you will not achieve it. So it's, it's inherent in its being a long range goal. It needs to be the number one that you actually organize your, your life around in order to actually accomplish it. Uh, can I summarize and ask a question here? So you're saying, first of all, it's not some transcendent thing. It's just number one among your goals, but you have it. You need to know what's number one so you can prioritize your time and effort. Um, it'd be interesting to talk about the level of abstraction of it. For instance. I'm writing a book, I'm writing two books, but let's take the second book on the philosophy of mathematics. Now, would 
writing a book on the philosophy of mathematics qualify as a central purpose or should it be something a little more abstract? I think it can. I, I think it depends a little bit on your circumstances. So in your particular case, writing the book on the philosophy of mathematics actually fits into your entire life. And so yeah. you might actually want to name your central purpose a little bit more abstractly, which I mean, I'm just going to make a stab at it, Harry, to uh, uh, apply Ayn Rand's epistemology to clarify critical areas in uh, of of human knowledge that have been distorted by the Kantians. I, I mean, I, I'm just making something up, but that would integrate both your book, How We Know, and uh, uh, the book that I think you're working on in mathematics. And then you would see it instead of being the central purpose, you'd see it as, as a, 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 the current project under the central purpose. And it doesn't matter that much either way. You have your clear direction. Mm -hmm. And it might okay, give you, a... right, with that kind of an abstract meaning, it might actually give you more motivation on your book. But I think you can start with, say, a book goal. And then as you work toward it, build the meaning. You don't have to start with the passion. You need to start with a goal that you're willing to commit to. But you don't have to start with the passion. If you pursue the goal in the right way, you will build the passion. All right. Now we get to the real question. Uh, I don't mean the other was unreal. The particular question that Abdullah is asking, how do you know and choose your central purpose? So, uh, I, yeah, I agree. That is the central question. There's one other preliminary thing I'd like to talk about before we jump right. into that, if that's okay, which is mm -hmm. why is it so important to have a central purpose? Yeah, and, that's a good, good idea. You know, yeah. Right. And I think that it's one of the things I think I've contributed is to really flesh out psychologically how important this is. Because if you don't have a central purpose, you have an experience of being pulled in many directions by the many values that you hold. Everyone has thousands and thousands of values. And if they're all at about the same level, you're going to be pulled this way. You're going to be pulled that way. And you may do a lot of things, but it's not going to add up to much. If you want to have a really happy life, you want to be able to see long-term success, you want to see it add up to something, and that's what really gives life meaning. It's the things that you create in this world, the productive undertakings you do, that actually create new things that give meaning to your life. And so the reason you need a central purpose is to organize and ensure that you actually create things on a long-term scale to get the kind of deep happiness that is possible to a human being here in the 21st century. And I think this ties in with the point that Leonard Peikoff makes that it needs to be a productive goal. And it ties in with uh, the, the talks I've done on central purpose and happiness on how that it's the achievement of goals. It's the sustained achievement of goals that really leads to that deeply happy life. And when you have a three or a 10 year goal, you obviously need to break it down as sub goals. You need to pursue it in such a way that you are seeing progress as you go. And that then is a source of continuing joy in your life and continue it creates, you have a sense of yourself as accomplishing something that's psychologically, it's extremely important to have this. And, and so it, 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 the only qualifier I'll say here is it makes your life happy if you pursue it correctly. You can pursue it in such a way that it will, you won't succeed and you'll be miserable, but. Yeah, um, it has to be a rational purpose, a productive purpose. So I'll just take a second on that. Suppose someone loves tennis and decides his central purpose is to improve his tennis game. Could that qualify? It would not succeed in the sense that it would not, uh, it, there would be, it, the result would be something that is too ephemeral and too non-objective. Uh, now he could, if, if, if he decided tennis and figuring out how to do tennis is, is the thing that he is most interested in, he could set as a central purpose to 
to develop a methodology whereby people can continue to improve their game indefinitely, right? In which case he would turn it into a knowledge goal and he would actually produce results where he could produce teaching. Now, in the course of that, he would improve his tennis game. But if, he, if you just do it as sort of a self-improvement type thing, the, the, you don't get the objective results out in the world. And you know, sometimes people think sports can provide objective results, but the truth is sports are recreation fundamentally. Of course, you can have a professional athlete. That's different. That's actually turning it into a, a productive undertaking. But otherwise, what you'll find is that the vast majority of your time uh, will not be integrated with this undertaking. Whereas if you actually turn it into something where you're producing a value that you can trade objectively with other people, it will integrate. It will integrate your relationships. It will integrate your intellectual time. And it will integrate uh, what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, that's what I was thinking uh, when I asked the question, if you became, if you found a way to make money, money is only a symbol, yeah. but if you found a way to create real objective external world value that you could then uh, produce, uh, uh, trade with others uh, about, then it would have a reality that yes. just getting better and better at your own private tennis game uh, would be more or less in your, not really in your head, but in your head and your body and not in the external world. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. I, I see that. I agree with that. And there's a lot of um, possibilities for things that sound like hobbies, if someone really loves them, to become income earning or right. productive in a wider sense. Right. And it doesn't have to be income earning, but income earning is, I, mean, I think it's, I think it's actually, if you set as your goal to make a lot of money, that actually does not work as a central. Yeah, purpose. that wouldn't be the goal. Right. right. Um, the, uh, although I know someone who loved making money, who basically set as his goal to figure out the absolutely best hedge funding, hedge fund trading algorithms and made a ton of money as a result of it because he was so interested in it. But the goal was actually much more about how do you, figure out these algorithms rather than about making money because um, he found that very interesting. Uh, but uh, so it needs to have actual objective meaning. It needs to be an actual creation and that, but that creation, I mean, particularly like if you're retired, I think everyone needs a central purpose because whatever age you are, you need to have long range goals. You need to see the future and be working toward the future. That's going to keep you young if you're older. And but retired people, it doesn't have to make money. And so people pick up art and novel writing and other things that are probably never going to be financially remunerative, but they don't need to be. And that oh, is yeah. fine. They it have a different objective result. If you can sustain your life by your investments, so let's say, which don't take that much money because you've worked during your life to accumulate or even if you inherited it. And you do something else, uh, it doesn't have to earn the equivalent of your life uh, standard, you know, standard of living. It doesn't have to support all of that. But I think it does have to have some kind of tradable or objectively yeah. recognizable value. Yes. Okay. But you let's create. Yes. So can let's I say get one? To the big one. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes. Because we're, we're getting halfway there. Now, right. so halfway to the end. So how do you find it or choose it? Right. Uh, so I think that on the one hand, don't make this so hard. It is a decision process. You know, the words in the title for this was, where do I find one? And that's kind of the wrong attitude. Like, oh, no, I have to look around and find a central purpose. Where is, where is it? Where is it? Oh, no. First of all, you, if you have long range goals, it's probably a decision process. Which of these is going to be the primary claimant on my time, energy and resources? And that is, I'm not saying that's an easy decision process, but one of the reasons we needed to talk about why a central purpose is important is so that you understand some of the considerations in choosing something as a central purpose, because you're going to organize your life around it. And that's really a commitment process, which involves 
really looking at when you do this and you put the time in on this, what is going to get cut? Because when you make something be, and I think, I think to be a central purpose, I think there's a minimum of say 10 hours a week you need to be putting in this. It needs to be a big enough project that's going to take 10 hours a week. Now, it could be 40 hours a week. I think less than 10, it's hard to maintain a significant yes. momentum over the long term. I would say 12. It's <laughs> two hours a day, six days. I, I, I'm not going to argue over 10 versus 12, but it's something in that range. It's not a trivial amount of time. And right. so you, you need, you know, that is to be able to block out that time and make that available week after week that is a commitment and so i think the biggest part of it is choosing somebody and saying okay i am willing to make this commitment now uh one of the things i teach you know i i, I teach people how to do this in my thinking lab and uh, which is at thinkingdirections.com if you want to check out my other work uh, where was is, that thinkingdirections.com so thinking, yes, T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G, directions with an S, D-I-R-E-C-T-I-O-N-S -D dot com. So uh, it, it's, it's the plural form of it, and it's like which way you're going and how you direct it. It's an interesting play, and you, I know you thought that up yourself. I didn't have any input into that. That's true. Okay. So, so. The, the thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, the commitment is part of it. You need to actually think in advance, what's your life going to look like if I make this be number one? And, and, but then the other part of the commitment is, which I learned from you, is once you make that commitment, then you need to actually figure out how to make it work. And there is a lot of experiment and trial and error in if when you start a new long range undertaking in say getting on a day uh, getting on a daily schedule so that you can put the time in uh, i run a, a program called launch the next one starts at new year's and it runs eight weeks and one of the things people use launch for is to get a schedule set up so they're actually working every day on their long range project because you often need a warm up, you need a cool down, you need to figure out should you do it in the morning, should you do it in the evening. If you have a day job, you need to figure out how it's going to fit with the day job. And there may be other skills that you need to develop. So it helps if you already are wildly passionate about it. It helps because that helps to motivate you to do this. But if you're not already to, to figure solve all those problems, if you're not already wildly passionate, it's still solvable, you just need to actually commit and get some help to set up that system. Now, uh, I want to talk about, maybe we should tie I'd that like up. I'd like to talk more yeah. about how you uh, find or know or choose yeah. your central brain. Which yeah, one, so, where is it, right. what, what is it? Right, so I think the problem that some people have is that when they go to make this decision, they're sort of blank. And they say, I don't know, it's not obvious. They don't have, uh, they don't have a couple of contenders for a long range goal. And this is a symptom of just not being that self-aware of all your values, which, you know, it, it, we're not taught to do this. So don't be, don't be embarrassed about that. But like any decision, you need to actually know the options before you can make a decision. So if you find that when you think about your central purpose, it's like, I don't know, I have no idea. I have no idea what I wanna do or what I'd commit to. Then you need to instead, Commit to warming up the context of getting to be more self-consciously aware of your values. And I, I actually recommend a very specific purpose for this, which is you commit to spending 30 minutes each day thinking about your values. And uh, there's, this is actually written up on my site. There are articles on central purpose on my blog, which you can check out. And there's a class in the, in the thinking lab. But you do a different thing each day. Like one day you might write down three good things that happened yesterday and why are they good? Well, that's going to clarify your values a little bit. Another day you might look at the, va the goals that you've previously achieved and why did you achieve them and why did you care about those things? And then another time, I know someone who did this in the last launch took part of her time to go through all the books she had on her bookcase. And she just reminded, she, was, she retired and was trying to figure out what the next phase was going to be. 
And she went through her whole book and, went, oh, God, I'd forgotten. I was so interested in that, wrote about, you know, this or that or the other thing. You know, at the end of eight weeks, she had surveyed all of the values in her life and a three-year goal just plopped out as a wonderful thing for her to do, which I think is very, very common. It's not that you don't have the values. It's not that you don't have the interests. It's that you don't have your goals and your values organized enough so you can just ask yourself a question and get an answer. And so the thing I would, if, you're, if your reaction to, well, what's my central purpose is, I don't know, I would commit to a couple of months, 30 minutes a day of exploring your values. Um, let me give an example of the kind of introspection that you can do. When I graduated from undergraduate school, I had two paths open to me. I was already an objectivist at that point. I was doing a lot of work in uh, cognitive science, brain and perception, uh, which I really liked. And I could go to graduate school there. The other thing was philosophy, which meant objectivism and getting objectivism into the culture. And they seemed to me approximately equal. Then it occurred to me, well, you know, philosophy is the wider uh, topic. And if I don't know, if I go into philosophy and then into neuroscience, uh, I will have, you know, been in the in something that does apply to neuroscience, and it it will be like a genus for neuroscience because all the sciences belong to philosophy. Some years later, I realized what I didn't intro introspect. Now that was a crazy argument, and it there's no spillover to speak of between philosophy and neuroscience. I could have studied philosophy more on the side and, and pursued uh, neuroscience. But the fact that I came up with this argument showed that I really wanted to go into philosophy, which I could have introspected at the time if I'd known how to you know, analyze, well, how, what is that thought process telling me? I didn't have any rationalizations about how it would be better. <laughs> Here's when I could make up one. If I go into neuroscience, I can make a certain amount of money, which philosophy doesn't make. And using that, I would have savings that, although I had savings, but I could have made an argument or, you know, it'll acquaint me with concrete reality and philosophy needs that to build upon. So, uh, or it would show me how the mind works. And I, I could have made up that kind of crazy reason, or, you know, not crazy, but artificial reasoning, uh, but I didn't. So that that's an example of something I could have introspected, but I didn't. Well, that actually leads to a really important point because uh, this worked out for you and yeah. philosophy was really the right choice for you, I think. But uh, you can reach some conclusion and have a mistake built into it. And if you have a mistake built into it, what will happen is you'll find that instead of integrating your life, the central purpose is giving you some conflict, like you're feeling torn between things. And this is actually how I developed the method of, of uh, clarifying a central purpose is because I realized at a certain point in my career that I was being pulled in multiple directions to write a book to do the thinking lab and then to do uh, the, the business, to actually make the business profitable. And those seem to be in direct conflict. And this is, that is a symptom that I didn't have a clear enough central purpose because I didn't know how to prioritize those different kinds of tasks. And I went on, so the same process of you just need to get clearer on your values in that case, Part of what I did is I really got clear on why I had each of those three values, which seemed to be all part of one thing, but uh, it, it took a while. It took a while to actually figure out particularly how business fit. And I finally got rid of the conflict between the intellectual development, which always has interested me, and the business development by getting really clear that getting the business to be more successful 
meant that the ideas I had would have more impact. And that was when finally my central purpose organized around one thing. And my current central purpose is to, uh, to teach adults how to think clearly and logically about value laden issues, which is a lot narrower than what I was doing earlier. And probably this is a 10 year version. And then it's going to be probably teaching people how to be more precise, but it's, integrates the business work, it integrates the speaking I do, it integrates the writing I do, it's just a lot more integrated. And I figured out that I needed to clarify my central purpose by pursuing it and running into issues. And that gave me the data I needed to then clarify the goal. And that's what I generally recommend. You, it's in the pursuit of goals that you clarify your values, you clarify if you have old baggage, you sort it out. But the pursuing of the goals, first you pursue the goals, yeah. then you get the passion and the clarity. Right, right. So the mistake is to think, uh, if I look at enough careers and look at books, I'll find one I fall in love with that right. I didn't know about. Right, and uh, you'll be like oh. miraculously motivated to go spend the rest yeah. of your life on this. Right. That's but not in, the model. In, instead, you take what is most you at right now that that is the way you like to function and you pursue it and see what happens right. and if you make a wrong turn it's not even wrong if you decide there's something else that you like better you'll find that you gained a lot of strength like my rationalization said you know for your new career there's you're you're always stronger and better off for having done something rather than standing at the doorway for two years. If you spent two years yes. going in the wrong room, you you'll grow, you'll learn. And then when you finally go into the room that you think is better and best for you, you'll be a stronger person than if you didn't go into any room. Yeah. So uh, what do you think of this uh, common idea that do what you're good at. Well, <laughs> I have completely violated that. I actually went into the area that I was worst at. I was very good as an engineer and project manager. I was very, I was managing a $1.2 million program at age 24. I was wildly oh, successful. Yeah, but this, if you don't know what you, right. if you're uncertain oh. about what to do, do you think, and I'm not, Pushing you to say, right. yeah, you know, yes or no. But what about the idea? Well, I'm really good at X. I don't know what I should do. Maybe I should do X. Right. So this falls under what you just said. There's no harm if you don't know what to do and you see, well, I'd be willing to do this and this seems reasonable and put in the commitment and do the work. Yes, you will then learn a lot more about yourself. And that's what I learned by being an engineer. And, and Boy, my work is really influenced by my engineering background. There is no question about it. But what I learned from that is what interested me most was discovery of new things. I worked on an experimental project where we actually did things for the first time, and that was wildly exciting to me. And that is how I chose between philosophy and psychology. Lots of new work to do in psychology seemed to me all the, again, a rationalization, all the problems in philosophy have been solved. So I went into psychology. <laughs> The, um, the the thing, uh, gee, I had a thought, but it slipped out of my aged brain. So let's go to um, the next thing. And we just had, this will have to be questions. the last official. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two questions on this subject. We have three, uh, it looks like. But it was something, yeah. Oh, I, I think I was going to say you're the dictionary definition of somebody who did profited from time spent in another field. Yes. A uh, very, very, very different field is night and day difference. And yet you draw upon your engineering experience all the time in your work. Yes. Uh, Mary Aline says, I belong to Jean's Thinking Lab. She gives you a love uh, emoticon. Highly recommend you just signed up for the coming year plus launches and coaching. But you can get you can do less and get value. Thank you, and Mary Aline. Jerry uh, Kinkor says. The central purpose before the retirement age must be integrated into one's productive career. Apart 
apart from adding the word from temporary central purposes like maternity or other intensive care for another person, right? Not necessarily. There are things like acting could be your central purpose and you can't make a living as an actor, in which case you need a day job. Now the day job needs to be compatible with acting. So like a lot of actors are uh, waitresses or bartenders. And what do they do as they're waiting and bartending? They look at characters, yeah. they mimic people, they, they, they make money and they support themselves through the day job, but they integrate it in some way to acting. And if they, if, um, and if it, that's a job, you're talking about career, you're talking about career yeah. and acting would be the career. Yes. But the central purpose would also be around acting, right? Yes. The central purpose would be to, saying. yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's not true that it has to be, it, it needs to be consistent with your way that you actually produce material values that you can trade but it does not necessarily have to be the same as the way that you produce material yeah, values to support yourself. I, I think you, you, you and I both believe it does uh, because we're talking about the career, which may not pay for itself yet, but it, you hope it will. You, yes. you want to act and get, you know, paying roles. You don't want to just act in voluntary community theater. Right. Yes. If I mean, I, career. yes, if it's if it's if it's your central purpose, then you would want to do it professionally, but it might right. never support you. And I, I don't think that that is a show. I mean, at some point you might decide to you might decide that you're never going to be good enough to have it support you or that you want something that supports you or change in many different ways. But it is. Um, I, I just think it's important to realize it doesn't have to be the way that you make money now. But what the way you make money needs to be compatible right. with it. Right. It right. doesn't have to be compatible. Uh, sorry, it doesn't have to be your job. But right. it would be weird if, if you said, well, my career is I'm a banker. That's what I'm after. That's what I want to live. But my central purpose is to paint landscapes. Right. That, that wouldn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. You might say, I work at the bank, it's an important part of my life, but my passion, my central, per that's different. But if you say something is a career, you're saying it's it's your central purpose in that area. Okay. Um, well, we've really, let's, let's look at I one more. I think we can more. answer the last one quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Cyrano Danconia, who I, I, I have a feeling that's not his real name. <laughs> is a central purpose a big distinguishing feature of the objectivist ethics, e.g. for non-rational egoists? Is, is it revolutionary and shocking? Well, I have one point here, which is the fact that we think it's a moral issue. Of course, we think productiveness is a virtue, and we're the only people in the world who think that. So in that regard, it is radical and shocking. But a lot of people think that you need to have a purpose in your life they don't, they think that you can have things that are not productive. So like Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, a very interesting book. And he offers three different purposes that kept people alive in the concentration camps. A career type purpose, a, a family type purpose, try to keep a family member alive, or religion. And I think those other two are pseudo purposes and pseudo ways people get meaning, but there's only one objective way to get meaning in your life. And that is by creating material, creating values in the world, material values in the world. And so you do need a productive purpose. And that is objectivism uniquely. Yes. Yes, I would definitely. The, the usual idea of egoist uh, is someone who's a pleasure chaser, uh, a playboy. And uh, that's that's the farthest thing from objectivism, as you know, because you asked the question. Now, I wanted to end with this one observation, see if you agree with it. The reason why you have to have a primary claimant on your time and resources and energy is that it wires your subconscious. So 
if you want to be good at X, you've got to live X. If you want to be a painter, you've got to make painting be on your mind. And your subconscious has to know that you're looking at everything from a painter's viewpoint. If you want to be a banker, you have to have that as the integrator of your subconscious because you're going to rely on your subconscious to give you the creative thoughts that are going to make you succeed in that field. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. And I think that this is part of the reason why a long-term goal is necessary because that's a long-term goal is something that can integrate those things and that, that requires uh, that kind of long-term integration. And it's why it needs to be the primary claimant because that's going to take up a lot of mental space. And then there's the practical side of it, which is when you have, when you have now organized your subconscious around one thing, it makes your, it makes decisions much easier. There's a crow, crow benefit where it's, really obvious it's like well this versus these other things well this is the most important and you've organized your value hierarchy so that everything that ties into the central purpose gets importance and you can see how what you're doing now builds and that makes it much easier to make decisions and it is it's a and it, it also makes it possible for you to take whatever is coming in and relate it in some way to your central purpose because you've organized all your values around it Yes. And uh, that's what I was saying, that people maybe don't take seriously their own brains yeah. in the sense that Mine. you're stocking your brain with things, with connections all the time, either through conscious attention or through accidental associations. And if you want to be good at something, you've got to have that as the selector uh, for stocking, uh, uh, yeah, stocking your brain with ideas and information. Right. And, and it's a very philip- pleasant thing if you do that. Right. right. And that only happens if you make it a value. And how do you make it a value? By acting to gain and keep it. It is the work mm. on the central purpose that strengthens the values so that you actually get those connections occur to you and you can actually make them consciously. Yeah, so another philosophy might say, yeah, you need a purpose. For instance, world peace. <laughs> uh, you, you, it's not just that that is something not in your power to achieve. What, what are you going to do? What actions are you going to take to gain and or keep world peace? Uh, so objectivism is unique in its view of purpose, that it, a central purpose. One last shot, one last thing. Central purpose is not the fundamental purpose. Purpose is an issue wider than central. It's the central purpose. It's the primary claimant, not the only claimant. Your spouse or romantic happiness, if you don't have a spouse, is uh, not subordinated. It's to your central purpose, it's on another hierarchy, another chain. So it's not the only thing. You can have hobbies, you can have pets, you can have uh, love, and you can have a, a, a well-rounded life. But you you have to have a primary one, and that's the central purpose. Well, thank you very much, Gene. Uh, I've been excited by this, and I hope the audience has too. Thanks so, for having and- me, Harry. In uh, one week, I'll be back with a yet-to-be-disclosed new topic. Goodbye.